This video uses the results from previous videos in this series to look at how a free particle moves in the equatorial plane outside an uncharged rotating black hole described by the Kerr metric. In this fourth video in this series, numerical integration is used to generate plots of the geodesics in the equatorial plane that are followed by this particle. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to find the form of the derivatives of the coordinates t dot, r dot, theta dot, and phi dot under a restricted set of circumstances and use them to describe the motion of a particle of mass m. <clears throat> so because we're working with a particle of mass m, we're going to work with its proper time as the parameter by which we parameterize the path taken by the particle. And this particle, we will be restricting to the equatorial plane which is how we will simplify the form of tr, theta, and phi, the, the derivatives of those, with respect to tau. So t dot is dt, d tau, and so on. Our source mass, and for the calculations used in this video, the source mass will be a billion solar masses, um, and that's um, I'm using a, a black hole, known black hole from a certain quasar, which I've used previously in this series, I don't remember offhand the name of the quasar, but this is the black hole at the heart of that quasar. It has a spin parameter of 0 0.74. Okay, in red here is the tangent vector, the four, four vector, four velocity, uh, which is dx mu d tau is the derivative of each of these coordinates with respect to proper time tau. Okay, and the motion, we will restrict ourselves to um, the equatorial plane and uh, to releasing particles far from the source mass uh, with zero initial um, angular momentum and uh, just the uh, zero kinetic energy as well. Anyway, we'll get to that shortly. Let's just go back to the coordinates that we found in previous videos. We found expressions for the derivative of each of the coordinates with respect to proper time or some other parameter, c tau dot. If we're talking about particle mass, um, we won't use m obviously for massless particles here. Okay, now, uh, so in, for a particle of mass, we have this expression here. So this is the general expression. And same for phi dot, d phi d tau. Okay. All right, now, however, the radial r and polar angle coordinate theta were very large expressions. Uh, they're difficult to obtain analytic results with because of their very large and complex nature. These simpler results here came from a certain symmetry. Uh, from killing vectors. Anyway, that's all part of the Kerr uh, geodesic series earlier on. Now, if we restrict ourselves to the equatorial plane by setting theta equals pi on two, then, and the uh, polar component, the polar angle component of momentum, we set that to zero, so m theta dot is zero. Uh, that simplifies theta dot because it'll be zero throughout this analysis. We're simply going to remain at theta equals pi on two, which is the equatorial plane. Remember the geometry is symmetric about the equatorial plane. So the bottom half or the top half is a reflection of the other. All right, <clears throat> now, so let's just repeat those coordinates again. This time, because we're going to be in the equatorial plane, we're going to set theta as pi on two. So sine pi on two is one, cos pi on two is zero. So those trig terms will drop out and we'll be left with this. Uh, here we multiply, uh, multiply through by m, e on m, and then this c squared factor here, e on m c squared. So this is epsilon, as we defined in previous videos, epsilon, that's our energy parameter, which gives us the um, energy in the orbit of the particle. Um, phi dot is this object here. And again, removing the trig terms, we're left with this, multiplying through, uh, c squared and m here because it's e on m, so we get epsilon here. e on m c squared is epsilon, okay. And h on m, h is the angular momentum in the phi direction. All right, and r dot squared is this object here, again in terms of epsilons and h's. Now we can further simplify the physical situation by considering the case of a massive particle released from rest by an observer far from the source mass and with zero initial angular momentum. And that's the other simplification we'll make, zero initial angular momentum. 
when we do that, these ages will be set to zero. Okay, particle release from rest means epsilon will be one. And that means, and to explain that, that means the particle initially has no kinetic energy, it's released from rest. And so its total energy is the energy it has in its rest frame, E equals mc squared. And so epsilon, which is E on mc squared, becomes mc squared on mc squared is one. Epsilon is one, no kinetic energy. Now, if you just let me digress a little bit, um, I could skip this point, but uh, I just thought I'll uh, include it, even though it's a digression from the argument. Anyway, if the particle were moving with form momentum, P mu, that's a covariant form, so indices lowered, gamma m minus c u1, u2, u3, with respect to this stationary observer, and the stationary observer will have a four velocity vector, okay, u mu is c zero 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 because the spatial part is zero because there's no movement on the part of this observer then the particle passing the observer at the instant they inhabit the same location then the latter would measure the energy of the particle to be e equals minus p mu covariant that one u mu now the only two components involved will be p zero u zero because all of these are zero so the when we do this dot product here, the scalar product, we'll only have the first component, gamma m minus c times u mu, which is c, this c here, and the negative in front because we can't, we don't want negative energy. Um, so we end up with gamma m c squared. That is the energy the stationary observer will measure as a particle passes their position, and just at that instant, you know, just for an instant at which the measurement is performed sharing the same reference frame um, just for an instant and the observer measures the, the energy of this moving particle to be gamma mc squared now the kinetic energy of the party ek is gamma mc squared minus the energy in the rest frame all right so it gives you some idea of what this is okay um okay what do we got now yep so i'll just move on a bit bit of a digression okay so here's our situation we're going to have an astronaut freely falls towards our source mass in its equatorial plane while carrying a clock to record how long it takes him or her to reach the singularity. Uh, we'll look at how long it takes to reach the outer event horizon, then the inner event horizon, and then the singularity, the ring singularity. So this astronaut, far from the source, will carry a clock with him or her and count or record how many seconds it takes him or her to reach the outer event horizon and then keep going to the inner event horizon and to the singularity. Okay, now, far from the source, the astronaut has is released from rest, so initial zero initial kinetic energy and zero angular momentum in the phi direction, so we're setting h equal to zero as well. All right, so the derivatives of our coordinates now become t dot was this, and where the h was, we're going to put zero. That simplifies this. Here, where the h was, we put zero, simplifies that, and again with r dot squared, we're going to put epsilon is one, zero kinetic energy initially, and initially in the phi direction, zero angular momentum. As an approximation, this simplifies the task. Of course, the particle will, the astronaut will acquire angular momentum as he or she falls towards the um, source mass in the equatorial plane. Well, when we do that, we produce an expression r dot squared is this object here. So r dot is just plus or minus the square root of that depending on which direction, moving away or moving inwards. Negative is moving inwards. All right, now we want to find the equation of the form tau of r. Well, we could find an antiderivative, so r dot is dr d tau, is plus or minus the square root of that object there, depending on whether it's inwards or outward motion. So we get the integral of this, separating the um, differentials uh, and including a constant of integration over here. That's meant to be a constant. It's not the value of speed of light. It's not that at all. Um, when we do that, we find there's no simple closed analytic form exists, uh, even using a software package and so on. Um, or not, not a very simple one anyway, even if you do manage to with a software package. Um, so we have to resort now to uh, numerical integration techniques to find the antiderivative of this, this object here, and um, to plot it. So tau will be the numerical uh integration from r1 to r2 of this expression here we'd like to find an antiderivative um 
and so will result in numerical integration. Now this numerical integral will be evaluated from R1 as 8 gm on C squared all the way into the outer event horizon at R2 as gm on C squared plus the square root of all that. So that's the outer event horizon. The inner event horizon just has a plus removed with a minus. And then the ring singularity R is zero. All right, so plotting that is what we're going to do is take our lower limit as to be the event horizon, and then we're going to numerically integrate all the way up to the initial starting point. So we do that here. Here are the distances in the R direction. Uh, radial coordinate here. Okay, uh, numerically integrate this object here uh, with respect to R from the inner, from the outer event horizon, sorry, this one, all the way up to the starting point 8gm on C squared. I is 0 to n, n will be 20 intervals. So we'll have 20 ordered pairs here to plot. Next, we plot the ordered pairs to produce a plot of the antiderivative of r dot, which numerically expresses the equation tau of r, the proper time tau, which is the time recorded by the astronaut. Okay, so when we plot that from 8 gm on c squared, which is about 1.2 times 10 to the 13 meters, when we plot that in, we can see an element moving in. Here's the outer event horizon here, and it's taking roughly, it's getting towards about 50,000 uh, seconds to achieve that. Um, if we now plot into the inner event horizon, we're getting perhaps to about 50,000 thereabouts. And if we plot all the way into the ring singularity, that last bit's done very quickly as a fraction over 50,000, although that's hard to see on the plot. All right. So we notice there seems to be a form of acceleration at work here. And uh, earlier we found in one of the previous videos that MR double dot, the mass of the astronaut times the coordinate acceleration, is this expression here, is minus dV effective dr, and setting h is zero initially and epsilon is one, we get R double dot is this negative expression here. Negative because it's inwardly directed acceleration. It's direct the particle accelerating inwards. And you can see that roughly from about 1.2 times 10 to the 13 meters, it's taking the clock to reach the ring singularity, it's taking about 50,000 seconds, according to the uh, astronaut's clock. Next bit, if we just um, here, I've shortened the um, distance here for, to about four gm on c squared, about half of what it was before, and all the way into the ring singularity here. And you can see by about, the outer event horizon, here, which is about here. Okay, that's about there, which is here. You can see the acceleration really starts to take off. After about the outer event horizon, the acceleration really asymptotically uh, takes off. Just becomes really exponential. And that's this object here. That's what the numerical integration is telling us. All right, next step. We've dealt with the astronaut carrying his or her clock. Now, how about a second observer in a laboratory at a fixed distance from the source, source mass? Far from the source mass records how long it takes the astronaut to reach the event horizon. So this observer in the laboratory has their own clock and they're going to record and they're going to remain stationary at a fixed distance from the source mass. And they're going to count off the seconds it takes them, uh, the seconds they uh, measure for the astronaut to reach the outer event horizon. Now this second observer is a coordinate observer measuring coordinate time t. Both parties agree that t equals tau equals zero at the instant the astronaut passes laboratory. So we can take that as the point at which the astronaut is released from rest. Um, they both agree on the proper distance to the event horizon at this point, hgm on c squared. All right, now the second observer measures uh, dr dt, which is dr d tau times d tau dt, which is r dot on t dot. So from the early expressions we had, dr dt is minus because it's going in the inwards direction. So it's this object, r dot here over t dot, this one. Okay, uh, when we try to, uh, when we separate the, the differentials there and try to uh, anti-differentiate to look for a um, symbolic uh, antiderivative, um, analytic solution, we can't find one. Uh, so we have to again resort to numerical integration. So we're going to set our lower limit as the outer event horizon, A, 
and um, the upper limit as the starting point at which the astronaut is released from rest will have n equals 60 intervals because it looks nice when I plot n equals 60. You can clearly see the pattern there. All right, so we set up our table here and integrate this. All right, and now I didn't put a minus there because we're integrating from the event horizon itself out. So we get these 60 ordered pairs. Next job is to plot them. Okay, they're the options we put in for plotting. And when we do that, we end up with this plot here. You can see this is coordinate time t measured by the observer in the laboratory according to his or her clock. As we can see, it takes a lot more than 50,000 seconds. In fact, as you can see, this plot, this curve asymptotically approaches the outer event horizon, but doesn't actually uh, connect with it. It will get closer and closer and closer as time goes on. So according to the second observer, the astronaut never crosses the outer event horizon because it takes that him or her an infinite amount of time to, to reach it. Okay, and that's that.